Good afternoon. Welcome to this um, webinar of the Corbel Leos Clive uh, series, Engaging with Your Community Through Events and Training. Today, we have with us uh, Sarah Morgan from Ember EBI to present Course Design and Delivery Guidance and Tips for Impactful Training. My name is Martha Lloret, and I'm involved in the Corbel and EOS Life projects on behalf of Ember EBI, and I will be hosting this webinar. Before we start, I'd like to remind you that this webinar is being recorded and will be available uh, for viewing online in a few days. We will have a question and answer session at the end of the webinar. So if you have any questions, please write them in the questions box of the GoToWebinar panel, as you can see in this slide. Before we start, I will briefly introduce you to the Corbella Neos Life project and today's speaker. The Corbella Neos Life are projects funded by the European Union under the Horizon 2020 program, and they bring together biological and medical research infrastructures. The collaboration that was started among these infrastructures uh, in Corbel will continue in the next years through EOS Life. Modern biological and, research, uh, and biomedical research involves complex projects uh, that combine a variety of technologies and usually operate at the interface between different disciplines. Corbel will contribute to these projects by harmonizing, by harmonizing access and services um, for research that involves more than one research infrastructure that offer biological and medical technologies, biological samples, and data services. EOS Clive is building an open collaborative space for digital biology in Europe. Its mission is to establish EOS Clive by publishing fair life science data resources in EOS, the European Open Science Cloud, create an ecosystem of innovative life science tools in EOSC and enable groundbreaking data-driven research in Europe by connecting life scientists to interoperable European clouds via open calls for participation. Today's speaker is Sarah Morgan, the Scientific Training Coordinator at Embel EBI. She has a BSc and MSc in Biomedical Sciences followed by a PhD from Cranfield University and an MA in healthcare law and ethics. Over a 10-year academic career, her research has focused on tumor biomarker characterization and cell surface interaction. Beyond research, she took an active role in the provision of postgraduate taught courses for the university as a lecturer in molecular medicine leading the development and direction of a number of MSc courses, including the MSc in Translational Medicine, the MSc in Molecular Medicine, and as director for the MSc programs in Advanced Biosciences. She has lectured on a variety of biomedical techniques and topics, including ethics and governance of research. Sarah joined the EBI in 2013, initially as training program manager where she is responsible for running the external user training program, responsible for all on-site, off-site, and online courses. She is additionally the Elixir training coordinator for the Ember EBI node and course director for the postgraduate certificate in biocuration at the University of Cambridge Institute of Continuing Education. And now I will hand over to Sarah. Okay, well, thank you very much indeed, Marta, for the um, for the introduction there, and uh, thank you all for coming along to listen to the webinar today. Um, as Marta said, hopefully this is going to give you a few practical tips um, around course design and delivery. Originally, this was due to be a, a double act session, along with uh, Dr. Gabriela Rusticci, who unfortunately isn't able to to join me today. Um, but really, this webinar or the session really comes from our experience of designing and delivering short training courses over the last seven to ten years um, and also experiences gained through um, work on the elixir um, train the trainer program the emble ebi trainer train the program um, and really some of the various things we've also picked up from training lots of trainers over the time 
it's quite a difficult thing to try and distill, I guess, all of the things we, we normally try and put across in a Tudo Train the Trainer into a very short webinar session. But at least hopefully this will give you um, some ideas to think about, things to think about when you're starting off with new courses, new sessions, um, and also, um, you know, new things to think about when you're when you're next doing um, something along those lines. The actual session today, um, I'd like to take you through, you know, some of the key elements to try and ensure your training does meet the needs of your intended audience. Because really, in terms of impactful training, making sure you're delivering what people need is really the major thing here. Um, talk a little bit about some things to think about to actually make sure your training delivery is successful. And then take you through a little bit of the impact assessment um, of training in both the short and long term. Um, and also talk a bit about, you know, how how you can use that um, to both improve your um, skill and also how to improve the courses you're delivering. So I guess the first thing to think about is really why do people generally look for training? Um, this is something we, we talk through as part of Train the Trainer course. It's something we always think about when we're putting new courses together at the EBI. And there's a number of different reasons. Often the people that we see, for example, through EBI and many of the, our Elixir colleagues, it's people who need to be able to do something. Um, for example, they have some data there that they, they need to do something with. They need to learn how to analyze this fairly quickly. So, you know, it's, these are the kind of questions people will well be asking. How do I do? What does this mean? Where can I find more about this? How does this work? So a lot of the training we're looking at is very much skills based training, trying to teach people some things so they can do something they couldn't do before. And this, of course, helps us start to think about how we can design something which will really give them the skills that they're looking for. The other thing, of course, is thinking about, OK, so what kind of course are we going to develop? So it's all in good saying we know we need a course on X, Y, Z, but we also have to think about the mode of course. And, um, you know, there are various factors that do influence people's choices, of course. And this is something that, again, we've looked at a little bit at the EBI um, and across Elixir we've looked at. So, you know, time, time both in terms of is this available now for me to do? Or am I going to have to wait six months to a year to do it? Time in terms of the length of time I'm going to have to spend actually learning this subject as well. You know, how long a course is it? Money is obviously a major factor. You know, can I actually afford to go and do this? Um, the calendar, again, is because of the time in place. So, you know, where, um, which month this is this happening? Um, you need to have a think about the location. You know, is this in my country? Is it in the country next door? Is it halfway across the globe from where I'm, I'm actually working? Um, do I want to do this as a face-to-face -face course? Do I want to do it as an online course? Um, most of the people, um, or many people who talk to them are looking more for face-to-face, for -face, but more and more people are looking online. And obviously at the moment, face-to-face -face is incredibly difficult. So online is, is something a lot of people are looking at. And I think we'll probably end up touching upon that a little bit at the end. So there's lots of things that can, can influence really what it is they're looking for. So the question is, you know, where do you start? If you're designing your, your new training course, designing your new training sessions, where do you start? Really, it's starting with your audience in, in my mind. And, and, you know, this is something we focus on a lot is kind of knowing really who that audience actually is. Identifying your target audience is not necessarily easy. Um, and, you know, you've got to think that, OK, you may have or you may have the idea for the best course in the world. But if you haven't got an appropriate audience for that course, you're not going to have that fantastic, fantastic course after all. And remember that course, you know, audiences on the surface may look quite similar. But when you start delving into them a little more, actually, they look quite different. So, you know, these different people and you, you're not necessarily going to have um, a nice homogeneous audience either, um, no matter how much you try and, and pull people into a particular group, there is going to be some heterogeneity in there, of course. So you need to think about, you know, who is it that you're actually trying to, to design and deliver this course for? So you can make sure you are delivering exactly the kind of things they're looking for. So there are a number of questions you can try and ask to try and identify this audience. 
So the first thing being, who are they? So, you know, how can you actually describe this particular group you're looking at? So some of the descriptions we often use with some of our bioinformatics course are things like they are bench-based researchers or lab-based researchers. So often wet lab people who are looking to learn a bit more dry lab. Where are they? Now this could be again, where are they in terms of the kind of sector they're based in, if you're aiming a particular thing at a healthcare sector rather than a general academic research or even industrial sector. Or it could also be where are they geographically? You may find that the particular group you're looking at um, because of their specific topic of interest is in very specific um, geographical locations. What is it they're actually trying to do? Now there are a number of ways of, of looking at this question and you know one of the big things could be well what is the problem they're trying to address? What's the the fundament, you know, what's the skill they're trying to learn? What's the particular type of data they're trying to, trying to analyze? Um, and, you know, what do they really want or need to learn about? So if, you know, that's the kind of problem they're trying to address, what is it they need to learn to be able to address that issue? Knowing what they know or having a, a, some knowledge of what they know already is also obviously going to be quite useful to you. So you know at what level you can start building that particular course. Um, and then the kind of unwritten question, but you know, it's, it's one that you really should ask is, is this an audience that really exists? And this is a question that, you know, we've, I think we faced a few times where you will talk to somebody, so, you know, yes, this is a wonderful course and, you know, we've, we think we've got this, it's like, but, but where are those people? And sometimes it can be quite difficult that you do come up with, you know, a great idea for something where you really think, um, you know, it's something that lots of people want to know, but actually when you try and go out and find that particular group, they're not necessarily quite so um, forthcoming as you thought. Now, it may be that actually you maybe just described the course slightly, you know, in, in a slightly um, odd way to that particular group, or it could be that actually that audience really doesn't exist. So, you know, it's almost like having to do a little bit of market research at the beginning to check that, you know, the, the kind of idea you have in mind, there is that audience out there. Um, or, you know, if there is an audience coming to you requesting some training that you get to the you know, getting the skin of what it is they're actually trying to do. Defining your audience, as I say, is, you know, extremely useful for a number of, oh, apologies, that's gone back a step, for a number of reasons. Um, you know, it also lets the learner know that the course is for them. So, you know, when you're defining your audience initially, yes, you're doing that so you can design that, that course. But if you have it well defined as well, when you're presenting that course to the trainees, presenting the course to learners to sign up, it lets them know that, you know, this is the course that you should be looking at. So you can tell them who you designed the course for. You can tell them what they need to know in advance. So this kind of prerequisite information. What, what prerequisite knowledge do you expect them to have so that they can make the most from the learning opportunity? And this is definitely one thing that can be difficult to get across to people, but is, is obviously extremely beneficial if you can. That kind of, you know, don't, don't come to this course unless you've got this background knowledge because you will not get the most out of the course. Um, but also, of course, very importantly, um, you can also spell out to them what it is you expect them to gain from the course as well. And hopefully that that expectation that you have that this is what you will gain fits in very nicely with what they are hoping to gain from such a course. So, as I say, start with defining your audience, start with getting to know who your audience is, getting to know exactly what it is they're looking for, where they are, obviously the, the where they are their situation, you know, what sector they're from maybe is potentially going to influence the mode of training you deliver as well. Um, and, you know, industry being a nice example, where often industry, they are looking for those shorter courses. They don't necessarily have quite such a, a long length of time to be released from their, um, their roles to go and do training. So it may well be that whereas a, a five to 10 day course might work for an academic candidate, for an industry candidate, you may be looking for a slightly shorter course, for example. So define your audience. Moving on to the, the really the, the bottom um, point here about what you expect them to gain from the course. This is where you then need to start thinking about defining um, your course aims. Sorry, my slide is not going. 
So thinking about defining your course aims and your learning outcomes. So these are the kind of things where you'll see the statements, this course provides an introduction to. So this might well be your course aim and your learning outcomes. At the end of the course, learners will be able to. Why are these important? Well, they help set the scene for the course, really. They enable you, um, they enable other trainers on your course to agree upon what the course really is aiming to provide to your trainees. It's almost like a kind of mission statement for the course, I guess. Um, kind of thinking, this, this is what we are trying to do with this course. This is the information we're trying to get across to you. These are the skills we, we're trying to get to you. And again, it's another part of that telling the, the trainee what they're going to get from the course um, to enable them to decide whether or not this is a course that's appropriate for them. So as I said, the course aim really is, is the mission statement. It should be a fairly concise statement of what the course is setting out to achieve. So there's a number of questions, again, that you need to ask yourself. So you've got this course idea, you've got this audience in mind. Well, what is the purpose of the course? So why, why does this course need to be in existence? Um, and what is it that you're going to try and achieve through that course? When you're doing this, again, think the idea of, you know, what is the purpose of this course? This is where you also maybe want to have a look and think, are there lots of other courses around that are very similar to this? Um, if there are lots of other courses, is there space for your course? Is there something maybe slightly different that you're bringing? Or actually, are you doing something quite similar to the others because there are still lots of gaps in the training need for that as well? And again, I guess this is part of the kind of knowing your audience and knowing what they're looking for is also having a bit of knowledge of what else is happening in the, the training community around the, the subject that you're training in. So, you know, can you see those gaps there so that you can see that the, the course purpose you're trying to fill, that there is a gap for that particular course? Setting your aim, as I say, you know, gives you that, that major, right, this is what we're trying to do, this is what the course is trying to achieve. The next element then is really trying to look a little more detail at what those um, learners, trainees are then going to gain from the course. And this is where learning outcomes come in. So learning outcomes tell the learners what they're going to gain from a course. And again, these should be a set of um, nice, concise statements which set out the skills or competencies that learners or trainers should be able to get by the end of the learning. And if you're trying to write these, then you should think of them in this way so that they should be smart. They should be quite specific. So hence the concise element of these that, you know, and, and really quite specific in what you're looking at. They should be measurable. There should be some way of assessing. Now, I mentioned assessment a little bit later, but, you know, when we talk assessment in short training courses, we're not necessarily talking, you know, the formative um, uh, or the summative assessments that we have with educational courses, you know, where they will actually do an assignment and, you know, it'll get marked and they'll get a, a mark at the end. But there should be some way of being able to assess both on behalf of the trainer and the trainee that, that learning outcome has actually been met. They should be achievable. So it should be something that you, you can actually um, teach them. Um, realistic in the context of, of what you're trying to do um, and time bound. So again, within the time that you've got, um, you should be able to teach those, those trainees to do that particular, um, that particular thing. The one thing with learning outcomes is to think that you may have an, a couple of different levels of learning outcomes when you're thinking of a course. So you, you may well have your course level outcomes, um, which will be fairly high level. So looking, you know, if it's a five day course, really, you shouldn't have any more than, than four to six learning outcomes. If you're then looking at your individual sessions within your course, each of those may also come with or it's good practice, really, that each of those also comes with their own learning outcomes. And again, there should be two or three statements which sort of say this is what um, you're going to gain from doing this particular session. But the levels of detail are obviously going to vary between those two because, as I say, your course ones are a slightly higher level. Writing learning outcomes can sometimes feel like a bit of an art, um, but there are ways to help and ways to, to guide you in terms of how you think about what it is you're trying to get your trainees or where you're trying to get your trainees to. 
And obviously when you're writing your learning outcome statements, this is also where you need to think about what is it that your, your trainees already know? So where, where are you taking them from? So it really is thinking, this is where they're starting. This is the end point I'm trying to get them to. So this is why something like Bloom's taxonomy um, can help you in terms of providing, if nothing else, a vocabulary to get you thinking about, you know, this is what I want people to be able to do. Um, I've popped in a Wikipedia um, entry here to give you a bit of an idea if you haven't come across Bloom's taxonomy before. Um, but Bloom sets out these different levels of educational um, uh, educational knowledge, etc. So starting with basic knowledge, which really is basic fact recall. Comprehension, <clears throat> where you start to get the meanings of, of those facts. Application, where you start to piece facts together. Um, and then we get into the sort of higher level um, uh, elements of the taxonomy then, where you start to actually look at where you start to apply those um, facts, the information that you've learned, you can start to analyze what that means. You can then start to synthesize new information and then you evaluate that in more detail. So as I say, this taxonomy can be very useful or is very useful. It's, it's the one um, I use, it's the one we teach in Train the Trainer um, to actually enable people to, to really think about where it is they're trying to get trainees to and how they can actually um, provide a, a, written, a written statement of that. So this is where you can um, go from um, the taxonomy to verbs, which help you um, describe what it is that you're trying to do. So here you've got a very basic example of such a verb table. Um, you can get, if you have a Google around, for example, you will find much longer um, verb tables um, that you can use as well for blooms. But the way you need to think about, oh, apologies, sorry, when I move my mouse, it's moved the thing on again. Um, Things like, you know, your learning outcomes need to state what a trainee will be able to do, stating that in a specific context, and you might even want to sort of comment on how well they might be able to do that or how quickly they might be able to do that. Um, an example I've given you here is one that comes from one of our courses. So to access, access and explore a range of resources to retrieve information on a specific protein of interest. So that's a, you know, a fairly concise example of of a higher level learning outcome from um, one of our courses. Do be careful with writing learning outcomes. There are a couple of terms that often appear um, in learning outcomes and really shouldn't. Um, one of which is understand, because actually assessing somebody's understanding unless it's in a very specific context is quite difficult or is potentially difficult. Um, the other one is appreciate, which again, you will often see. Um, I see that less these days, I must admit, but appreciate um, the importance of, again, how do you assess someone's appreciation? So keep this in mind, keep the smart elements in mind, and you know, think about how many things you're trying to put into that learning outcome. As I say, you know, it should really be one thing that you're looking for. Um, so one, one particular skill, one particular um, piece of knowledge within that outcome. So the next thing, I guess, is, is you know, you've, you've designed, you've defined who your audience is, you've got that understanding of your audience, you've been able to start thinking about what it is you want to provide to them in your particular course, you've thought about the outcomes. Now it's really thinking about delivering um, that particular course and obviously there's still design elements here in terms of what kind of sessions you're going how you're going to run them but you know there's there's a number of different things that um, will impact upon the successful and then impactful delivery of your training course and this is where again it's interesting when we do train the trainer looking at what people come up with in terms of what makes good training and this is an exercise we often do to to get people to tell us what they think good and bad training looks like obviously a major element here is the trainers um and you know there are numerous different ways that we can talk about the type of trainer we want but i think this just seals it down quite nicely that okay yes they need to be knowledgeable so they need to have expertise in the particular topic they're delivering you want someone with some enthusiasm because again, you might have the most knowledgeable person in the world, but if they are not enthusiastic about um, training and about getting that knowledge across, 
they're not going to be able to infuse that that group that they're trying to train you want them to be empathic so that they have some understanding or some knowledge of, of what those trainees in the room are going through. So they can always almost put themselves in those trainee shoes um, and you know really sort of maybe think around other ways of getting that, that information across. And you want them to be fairly flexible. So that you know if they've got a group who maybe does need to take things a little slower, that they can slow down the pace. Or if they've got a group that can move a little bit faster, that again they've got someone who can who can push them through it a bit more faster. A comfortable learning environment, and I'll come back to that in a moment, but both in terms of the actual space you're you're teaching in, whether that be a, a real or a virtual space, and the trainer approach. A mixture of learning methods, and we'll come back to that in a moment. But you know, again, using a mixture which will help keep people motivated and inspired. Opportunities for discussion and reflection. Um, you know, opportunities to get people together. Again, why do people often choose face-to-face -face over um, online training? Because they want the networking opportunities. And that's not to say you can't have networking um, and community building within online training but it is more difficult because you're not you know humans make connection face to face a lot of the time so again it's it's looking at how can you you know make the most of having those people together in the room and good event management as i said we we joke at the ebi that you know good good training often runs on coffee and cake you know don't forget that people do need to have breaks they need bathroom breaks they need lunch breaks you know they do need some downtime um, you can't keep them locked in your training room for 10 hours and expect them to all come out of it awake and alive at the end. But finally, the big thing, of course, is that you provide the learning that they need, that they're actually getting the learning experience, they're getting the knowledge that they were ultimately looking for. I want to delve into a couple of these tips in a little more detail with you. Um, and the first one being the comfortable learning environment. And this is something we often end up discussing a fair amount within um, train the trainer courses. And it's comfortable really in a number of ways. And I, it's trying to, trying to set this slide up actually elaborate this was a little more difficult than I thought. But first thing being physical comfort, which is fairly obvious to everybody. And I've said here, think three bears. Um, hopefully a number of you know Goldilocks and the three bears. Um, but you know, it's this idea of you've got a room maybe which is not too hot, not too cold, is just right. But you know, the kind of environment that you're teaching in is appropriate for what you're teaching. So, you know, obvious things. If you need computers to do your computer particles, you have computers, or at least they have computers with them. Um, you know, if you want um a course where you want a lot of discussion to happen and having a room where you can actually have people break out or having breakout spaces so that people can have those group discussions without everybody having to shout over each other um, and maybe having some space where you can bring people together as one big group at the end. But the other side of the comfortable learning environment, and I've, I've tried to sort of put this through as, as mentally comfortable, but it's really having that, that environment where people are, are feel safe and comfortable to learn. You know, a lot of the people, or a number of the people we see may well be a little bit concerned about coming into that training environment, especially if they haven't done any training for a while. If it's um, training in a subject which they don't have much experience of at all, they're gonna be a little nervous coming into it. So it's setting out your learning environment as, you know, being a comfortable environment for, the, for questions to happen, somewhere where they're going to feel that you know they're going to get support um, in the learning experience in the training that they're trying to get. So it could be things like you know setting out rules of engagement for your training. So that at the beginning of the session, you know you can say to people, look, this is how I'd like to run it. Please, you know, stop me if you've got questions. Put your hand up. I will answer them. Um, or if you want to say, you know, I'd like to get through this section and then we'll you know have a chat through it at the end. But at least let people know how you're going to do it. Um, have a look out for your quieter and louder members of the group. Um, ensure everybody has a voice so that everybody can participate in that training and really gets an opportunity to, to be part of it. The learning methods then, um, this, uh, this is actually a, a picture of a, a post up from a, a train the trainer where we had a bit of a look at various different learning activities. And I guess the, the, the main message here is try and have some variety. 
even if you know you are teaching a, a course on computational analysis, it doesn't mean you have to spend all your time sat behind a computer. Um, you know, it's having having a change in pace, having a change in, in the type of session will keep people motivated. Um, it does make sure they, they don't fall asleep on you, you know. But yeah, it's, it's making sure there's you know, that change in pace occasionally, making sure you've got different things, you know, different different types of information or different types of things that you're getting across them will need different ways of, of teaching as well. But also it's making sure that you can build in time for reflection so that people have got a bit of time to think, see how that fits, think how that fits with everything else they know, give them the chance to, to maybe play with some of the things a little bit in their own time as well. Some of that could be, you know, just giving a little bit more time um, between sessions, if you've got a couple of days, of course, you know, having a, a bit of a discussion session or, you know, leaving it as a right, you know, at the end of the day one, take that stuff away with, you know, have a think, beginning of day two, have a reflection on day one at the start of it. But it's, you know, having these different things. There are a number of different ways that you can teach many different things. And the main thing I would say is have a go. If you've got a, an idea for something a little bit different, have a go at it. You know, talk it through if you can find a, another trainer to have a chat through or a colleague who will chat through the idea with you. Use them to bounce ideas. Have a think about what you can do. If you try something and it doesn't work, don't panic. Either don't do it again or think about how you might be able to tweak it slightly and then try it again. Remember also course audiences or course groups differ. Um, time to time. So you may well find that with one group it worked fantastically, with another group it might not work so well. But you know, this is the this is the joy of, of delivering courses sometimes. But as I say, there's a whole range of different things you can do. I know um, we had one question um, from somebody prior to the uh, webinar asking about pre-training material. And is it realistic to ask people to do some work ahead of the course? And I think the answer is well, yes. Um, there was a quite part of the question again was how much is too much and I think you do need to be careful you know not giving people too much homework and you know if you've got a two-day course you're not going to give them something which takes five days to do beforehand but again this is part of the thing when you're actually writing your course description you're putting your course out there as an advert for people to sign up to if you're going to give them pre-work put it up there as part of that so people are aware of it as well um, sometimes we we give out bits of work which is more kind of if you want to check which level you're at you know this this is some work to do um, it depends entirely on the course um, you know you there's sometimes difficulty about whether people will do it all um, some people will actually ask it to be done as kind of homework so that it can be submitted and checked beforehand but of course, you do have to consider if you're going to give it and you're, you're going to check it before the actual course runs, um, you have to take the time to actually mark all of those things as well. So that kind of does depend on whether you've got the time to do that. But I think in general, most people, if they're signing up for it, they know about it in advance, it's sent out to them, most people will go ahead and, and try and do that work. But you don't want to make it so ridiculous that there's either too much to do in the time before the course or you're potentially going to put people off from actually attending. You don't want to worry them at that point. So thinking through the, the course now, obviously one of the things as I said we we talk about today is, is course impact. And you know, so you've you've designed that course, you've um, you know, you've either run it or you think of running it. Um, but it is thinking about how can you actually assess that learning is happening. At the end of the day, what do we want? OK, we want it to be a fun course that people enjoy and actually, you know, we'll recommend to other people. But the main point is that we want to make sure people have learned something and have learned something useful that they will take away with them and enables them to do something they couldn't do before. So assessing learning in short courses, I've said here, can be difficult. And assessing that learning has, the assessing learning has taken place, assessing the impact that learning has had, can be even more difficult as well. So there's a couple of things here that you may want to think about. You know, is learning happening during the course? Can you see that there, you know, that what you're teaching people is is going in, that people are are, are, are getting that knowledge, that they're they're feeling they're able to, to use that. When they get to the end of the course, do trainees feel that they have gained something? And you know, 
if you were to go back to them a bit later, is that learning retained, built upon, um, and used after the, the actual course has taken place? So in terms of actually assessing that learning is, is happening during a course, or even that, you know, towards the end of a course, you can see the progress that trainees have made, and also they can see the progress they've made, then bringing in projects, challenges, problem solving techniques um, through the course will enable you as a trainer to see that things are happening, but also enable the, um, the trainees, the learners to see things are happening and for them to feel much more confident. Projects, um, we started using at the EBI a few years ago now. Um, first with our, our summer school, we reworked it to actually have a major project component. Um, and it really is all about the, the trainees applying knowledge they're learning together in groups. But, you know, using sort of the, these, these ideas, you know, that maybe towards the end of a week, you put people into small groups and give them small targeted challenges, really enables you, as I say, to see what they have taken away from the learning. You can do it through a course, you know, it can be as simple as part way through a course running a quick quiz with people. Um, running a quiz at the beginning of the course and getting the answers and running a quiz towards the end of the course and seeing if the answers change and hopefully get more correct answers at the end. Um, but, you know, it's, it's really get, giving you a chance to see what they've taken from the learning. But more importantly, it's really embedding that learning further in the trainees' minds. So, you know, they're, they're getting more from that knowledge because they're having to apply what they've learned. Um, they're also having an opportunity to assess what they've learned and what their ability at that point in the course actually is. Um, and if you have these sort of projects or challenges towards the end of a course, it also gives you and fellow trainers an opportunity to work through any final questions, any final thoughts, any final misunderstandings, um, and you know, point them in the direction of some further things that they can go and do. The other nice thing with some of these projects and challenges as well is that if you capture every all of the progress they make in, in trying to address that challenge, so almost keep like a mini lab book around it, it's something else they can also take away with them then as a, another practical demonstration of what they've done and maybe something else that they can try putting into practice once they're back in their, in their own um, work environment as well. So, the last thing I want to have a chat through really is, is quality and impact post course and looking at how we can try and actually assess quality and impact. Um, and also thinking about why we're trying to assess it as well. And I guess the most employed method really is post course surveys. So you will often get um, short term assessment at the end of or your end of course survey. So, you know, either before people leave that training room or a day or so after they've left the training room, you may well send them a quick survey, which really is a, a, a real kind of short term, you know, did you enjoy the course? What, you know, do you think you learned? Would you recommend it? And really at that point, you're not going to get a huge amount of, of knowledge in terms of impact. You might get a little bit in terms of, you know, yes, they feel at that point that um, they have learned something, they have some new skills they can go try. Um, but you've not been able to really assess anything more concrete in terms of the impact that course has had on people. The one thing I will say is for these kind of surveys, try keeping them short or as short as you can. Obviously short, long enough so that you can get useful information. And this is really the thing to think about is focusing on questions which are actually going to give you useful information. What you need to, of course, think about is what what is that useful information you want and how are you going to use it? So one of the questions, again, that somebody else had raised prior to the uh, webinar is which feedback from a training participant has had the most impact on your subsequent trainings? Um, and really, it depends entirely what what sort of questions you're asking and which bit, because a post to the end of course survey can be very useful for um, trainers because if you ask questions about specific sessions then you can get some some trainer specific feedback um, and that can help them in their training practice um, you can get feedback generally on elements of the course um, 
things like if you ask about the balance of theory and practice, it might give you an idea of, you know, have you hit it right in terms of that? So those are the kind of things that can feed back into your course design and think, right, if we're going to redesign this course, are we going to rerun this course next year? Do we need to change anything? Do we need to maybe up this? You know, did it meet people's expectations? Did we provide what people hoped they would get? And that's that's the kind of thing to keep in mind when you are designing your your questionnaire. So the questionnaire that that we use, or the survey we use at the end of um, courses at the EBI, and similarly with the Elixir um, survey that's been set out, there are specific reasons and there's specific uses for every question that's asked. And if there was a question on there and we couldn't see a good reason to ask that, we've had we removed it. What more people are now starting to do is also long term assessments. And this is where you can really get a much better, um, a much better picture of the impact that the training has had upon those individual um, trainees. So these are where we do long term surveys. And this is something EBI has been doing for a number of years and, and Elixir has uh, been leading in, in their project. Um, looking at surveying at least six months to a year post course and then maybe even going back two years post course. And really finding out what people have done with what they learned since the course. Preparing those long term feedback or long term assessments, it's really thinking about again, what is the impact that you are trying to assess? Because trying to ask questions about impact can be quite difficult. But it's good to set yourself an impact statement. So try and define what the impact you are is that you, you are trying to have on those individual trainees. So the kind of things we talk about at the EBI are, you know, having an impact where we are enabling people to, to learn new skills which enable them to do something they weren't able to do before, to make them more competent users of data and hopefully to pass that information on to others as well. So these are the kind of questions we ask in the long term and our long term survey mirrors the, the Elixir long term survey. Um, and again, it's really looking around. So, you know, have you used what you were taught? If you have used it, you know, what sort of things have you been able to achieve? Um, have you passed this information on to others? Have you taught others? So these, these are the kind of questions you can ask. So I've got a couple of slides now focused specifically on the Elixir quality and impact assessment. So this is something that Gabri and I were involved in under the um, under Accelerate funding. And really the, the points was, so Elixir being the research infrastructure um, for um, life science data, um, there was a lot of training happening. There is still a lot of training happening under Elixir. And what we wanted was a way of being able to assess both the quality and impact of the training that Elixir was delivering. So the first thing was to assess, you know, actually who we were, meet, who we were reaching. So, you know, in terms of the audience demographic, um, we knew generally what the audience demographic of, you know, some of the, the key um, or some of the nodes um, were reaching. So we know that many people, it's um, academic audiences, sort of PhDs and postdocs. But again, looking to see could we extend our reach into industry, into healthcare, looking at the quality of Elixir badge training events in the short term, so directly after those courses have happened. And then again, trying to assess the impact of Elixir badge training events. Of course, the other side of this is not just assessing, but then also being able to improve the training quality and impact. So that by looking at the, the events that had happened, by looking at the feedback we were getting, looking at the quality and impact, we could then feed that back in as best practice for both Elixir and non-Elixir training. So the kind of questions that are being asked um, for the short term side of things, so demographic metrics, looking at, you know, the career stage, the sector, the country employment, gender of, of the trainees at those events. And then looking at quality metrics such as, you know, have you used the tools and resources before? Will you use them again? Satisfaction with the training overall and questions around recommendations. If people would recommend the course, that's generally a good um, highlighter of, you know, a quality course as far as those trainees um, are concerned. Other short term metrics, which again feed into um, issues that are feed into projects under Elixir, such as our training support system. Where do you see the course advertised? But also the important question of can we contact you in the future so that can we come back to you and ask you those more long term questions? 
long-term metrics then so there's a number of different things you can see here so you know okay we asked you whether you'd you'd use the tools and resources in the short term but you know looking back again how often have you used those tools and resources um you know thinking about before how do you use them thinking now now you've attended what are you doing with that do you feel you're able to explain to others what you learned so you know have you been able to pass that information on to others um, how did the training event actually help with your work? So it's really kind of, you know, what, what is the actual impact that it, it has had on what you're able to do? The other kind of things we were interested in looking at under um, Elixir was also, you know, whether the um, training event helped in terms of enabling people to publish, submit. Now, obviously, at the six months for a year period, there's not necessarily, you know, people haven't necessarily reached that point. But if we go to the two year period, you might have had people where, okay, being able to attend that course, being able to do that bit of analysis has led them to be able to progress further with the work that they're doing. Again, around um, explaining to others, you know, how many people have you shared this knowledge with? So, you know, how many people have you gone out and taught and, and shared with? So that we're looking for this multiplier effect. We know with a lot of the bioinformatics courses um, running cross elixir, there's often more people applying than there are places. So what we want is for people to go back and pass that information on to others. And again, would you recommend the training to others? And here actually one of the answers is not just yes or no, but it's a, I all, yes, I already have. And that's always a really interesting indicator to look at. In terms of the, the metrics from Elixir point of view, there is actually a database um, which has been collecting all this information. You can um, go in and, and have a look. And um, there are a huge number of, of training events that are in there and that have been collected over um, the number of years that we've we've had the training um, database going. Um, most of it is short term feedback survey responses. Um, there are a, a smaller number of nodes who've been working on the long term feedback. But again, the numbers of nodes who are doing long term again is increasing. And these are the kind of things we're looking at. So quality, you know, I would recommend the course to others. So about 90% of survey respondents have said that. The kind of impact comments we get, the training improved my ability to handle data, work more quickly or communicate with the bioinformatician, um, all important things. And then you can see how did the training help with your work? So, you know, being able to work more quickly, becoming better handling data, improved comms, et cetera. So these are the kind of responses that we're seeing. And obviously this is where, okay, it's it's fantastic for the individual courses because it means that those individual courses can now think, right, you know, this is what we're obviously getting right with this course. This is maybe something we need to work on. But also for others looking in and looking at these, um, these courses, it can also be a question back to the course org and say, okay, so what did you do to enable you to do that? You know, wh where do you think that that particular set of responses came from so that others can take that best practice um, and apply that in their courses too. So my final slide really is to, to just remind you though that course design of course is not static and that every course will at some point need some revision. And this is again why this quality and impact assessment is important. Um, you know, you might want to do minor revisions after every course or every couple of courses, depending on how often you're running those. You probably want to do some major revisions after a, a few years. Um, we often talk about a four to five year um, cycle for major revisions. Don't be afraid to try different things. You know, even if you had a course that worked wonderfully, if you've got an idea for something different, a uh, different way of getting something across next time, give it a go. Do remember every course group will be different. So something that will have worked fantastically well with one particular group may not quite so work, work quite so well with the next group. That doesn't mean it's not going to work again with another group. And the main thing is use that feedback. But again, think about it. If you've got, you know, a set of 30 people who've given you 30 responses, 29 are positive and that one is negative. Don't ignore the one negative, but don't let that negative one lead everything um, that you think about changing within that course. And hopefully, of course, what we're going to see at the end of this, and this is something that many of um, my fellow trainers sort of talk about this, is this idea of having your light bulb moment. It's when you see those trainees who've come in and are struggling with something and have finally got something. They've got the learning they needed. And when you've got that happening, you know that your, your training has had an impact and it's, it's really helped 
that uh, individual trainee. So at that point, I'm going to finish talking. Um, I would like to thank Gabri for those last few slides on Elixir Accelerate's work with quality and impact because she put those together. Um, but uh, at this point, I'll hand it over for any questions. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Sarah. So we have a couple of questions coming in. And I'll start with one about long-term surveys, as was, it was the last part of your presentation. How do you keep people committed to fill a survey after such a long time? <laughs> um, it's difficult. Um, we generally see um, about a 25% response rate. So if I'm looking at this through, so I, I can't easily comment on the response rates from the Elixir nodes that are, are taking part of the long term at the moment, but from an EBI point of view, um, we generally see a 95% response rate to our post call surveys, um, but at six months to a year, it's about 25%. It does then drop at two years. Um, partly the drop at two years is actually we start to lose people, because if you think a number of the people we see are PhD students, um, often they may have changed, if they've registered with um, institutional emails, those emails may have changed. Um, I think it's easier when you've been face to face with people because they've got more of that um, affinity with you. They've got that link with you and they are happier to, to continue. And we do tell them, we tell them at the beginning of the course that we're going to come back to them for long term feedback. We ask, we tell them at the end when we get them to fill in the, the short course. So it's not a surprise to them. Um, but I will say, even though it is a drop down to 25 percent, 25 percent is generally still seen as a very good response rate for um, for surveys. Thank you, Sarah. So we also have a question about um, tips related to engaging audience in online sessions uh, as we are facing this day. So do you have any tips for that? Yes. So online, um, I must admit we're, we're in the depths of uh, or in the midst of major discussions around um, turning a lot more of, of our face to face material online um, right at this moment. And I think the first thing to say is actually don't don't just imagine you can jump straight from what you've designed as a face-to-face -face course and just deliver that online, um, exactly as it is, because I think that the discussion we've had in House of the EBI is that really that, that's not possible. Um, having said that, there is a lot you can do, but I think you need to think about one of the great things, of course, when you're face-to-face -face is you can easily build that rapport up with individuals. And you maybe need to spend a bit more time building up that rapport in an online setting than you would face to face. Um, and you've got to give people a chance to actually get used to the technology as well and make sure they can use that. Um, there's some really good stuff. So um, there's a uh, an expert in e-learning called Julie Salmon. She talks about a five stage process for getting into um, e-learning and, and getting people um, into using it. And she talks about, you know, getting them to do really basic things to start with. So, you know, coming on and saying hello and you know things like this but it's it's just trying to get people comfortable in that setting initially and I think if you can get them comfortable you will then start to, to keep them engaged but also I, the other thing that we've been talking about a lot is is trying not to keep them in front of the screen too long in terms of you know not having very very long kind of talking sessions or this kind of thing um, because you will start to lose people and they will get distracted. Hopefully that helps a little bit. I think that helps a little bit, yeah. <laughs> so another question is regarding the um, projects to enhance collaboration between participants, for example, during summer schools. Would this be participant initiated or defined by the instructors? So when we've done them, um, we have always defined them. When we do the summer school, because people spend two, two and a half days working on these projects, we, we well, we define them, but we define them to be open ended. So we have a, a group of mentors, two or three mentors who will pull that initial project idea together and they are then there to guide the trainees through through the routes that they're going. 
Um, but we, we try and leave them a little open ended so that, you know, the trainees can take them where they want to. Um, in some other courses, we so we, we ran a zebrafish course last year where we had an idea in mind of the kind of things we wanted them to do, but they were able to focus it a little more on their specific interests. Um, the problem is if you start letting everybody define it, then you will end up on a course of 30 with 30 different projects. And that's not feasible to, to really run um, within the training courses and the way we run them. Um, but what we try and do is, if we're able to, we will look at the participants we have and think about defining projects which relate to the kind of things they're working on. Um, or what we do in summer school is define projects where we know there'll be a wide range of audiences who will want them and when they apply, they choose the project that they want to, to work on. Thank you, Sarah. So now we have a question that can link these two last questions with the group projects and the online training. So how do I manage interactions during e-learning? Example, peer exchanges or group work? So I must admit, this is where Marta is probably more expert than me on this one. Um, you know, there, there are bits of technology and hopefully Marta will jump in a moment. There are some of the technologies allow you to set up group breakouts. So you can, just like you would face to face, set people into groups, send them into a virtual room and get them working. Now, Marta has experience of doing this. So I'm going to hand this over to, to you, Marta, to, to give a little bit of comment on as well, if that's OK. Yeah. Yeah, that's OK. So, yeah, we've used some breakout rooms. So in um, in some platforms like similar to the one we are using now. And we've had people working on a shared document or just discussing about um, about a task between themselves and helping a bit each other. It's worked well for us, but it's been always with uh, small groups and with tasks that were not very long. I would suggest if you want to do that, you really need to structure pretty well the tasks they need to do and also explain them very well how to use the platform and how it will work, how they can ask for help and this kind of thing so that, so that they don't spend the whole time for the task in figuring out uh, the technical issues. You can, of course, also set a small task in the beginning of the course for them to learn that, which can be just introducing themselves or so, and then later on doing a more specific task about the course. I hope that helps. Thank you, Marta. <laughs> so um, we have another question asked, uh, is this relevant for training events in several disciplines? Very much so. Um, I think any of the stuff I've given or anything I've talked through today is, is applicable to to any particular training scenario, really. Um, as I say, some of this comes out of the, the train the trainer stuff we do. Um, I guess the majority of people we've done train the trainer with have been people who want to do bioinformatics training. But having said that, we've had a whole range of people who do want to do any kind of lab based training, some HR training, some marketing training. So yes, it's applicable. It's it's general training, um, general training thoughts. Okay, so uh, we are getting to the end, but I have one more question from what uh, you mentioned about the look for the quieter and louder people in a group. So do you have any advice about how to do that, how to give uh, a voice for everybody? So I think if you think, and this is, I guess, coming at it from a face to face point of view, you will often have people, oh, I say often, but I guess we do find them quite often. You may have people who try and, and dominate the conversation. They don't necessarily realise they're doing that. And, you know, that's something to, to think of. So you may have the person who always tries to answer the questions or you may have the person who always has questions to ask. And, you know, I've, I've seen scenarios at the EBI where we've had that person who's always wanting to ask questions and there are times when the whole course kind of groans when they next put their hand up. With people like that, sometimes it is a kind of, you know, brilliant set of questions. Tell you what, you know, we're, we're close to lunch break. Can we have a chat over lunch? And I will try and sort through a bit more of this with you. So you can at least try and diffuse it at that point. Or, you know, if they're always asking, you know, great to see your hand up again. Can we give somebody else a chance to answer the question? So at least you can try and quieten them down. You can try and manage them. The, the rest of the group can see you're trying to manage them. The quieter ones are more difficult. And I think part of that is maybe, again, making it clear that 
if they do want help, you know, that they can, they don't have to put their hands up, they can come and approach you, they can approach you at a coffee time and break time. If you've got them in group, um, group work, um, again, you should be wandering around and keeping an eye on the groups, you know, and, and seeing how those group interactions are happening. And if you see someone is a little bit quiet and doesn't seem to be joining in, you can always go and, you know, have a chat to that group and, and have a chat to that individual. Um, again, if you're in a setting where, you know, again, they're, they're working on stuff or, you know, they're, they're working around something, you've got someone who, who is looking a little, you know, worried, whatever, go and talk to them. Um, and I think this is, again, part of that thing of setting your room at the beginning so that you, you know, you set that comfortable environment so that, you know, you will be able to, to keep track of those people. It's not necessarily easy. And I think when you first start training, it can it can be a bit daunting. But once you get used to, to being in a training room, used to, you know, having people training around you, you do start to notice those things a bit more. Okay, thank you. So we don't have any more questions. Thank you, Sarah, very much for your presentation and your answers. And uh, thank you, everybody, everybody, for attending. Yeah, thank you very much, Marta, for hosting. And yes, thank you very much, everybody, for attending today. And thank you for the questions. Brilliant set of questions.